Doug, uh, Doug Rose, I will start uh, with you. What we can see from the poll is there are a lot of expectation on solar. And so can you explain us what, uh, what are the basics of the industry, solar industry? Happy to. Photovoltaic modules or solar panels directly convert sunlight to electricity. And the forecast for this year are about 30 gigawatts of installation. That's 30,000 megawatts. And that's enough to supply the home electrical needs for more than 20 million people for the next 25 years. And we've gotten there from really fast growth in the industry. Uh, the compound annual growth since 2000 has been about 49%. But the forecast for next year is low and then going up to, to 26%. And that's because we're transitioning to new markets around the world. Unfortunately, that slow growth right now in this transition is happening at the same time that we're getting the full effects of overcapacity relative to cur current demands. So there's a lot of pain in the industry right now. But if we look at the drivers for that growth, uh, one of them is that PV can be used in just about any segment for electricity generation, that it can be on rooftops, a residential, commercial, and I think we have a, a slide that shows some of those applications so you can visualize it. Uh, it can be in small power plants near load centers, and all of those applications require less transmission compared to having a big central station power plant. And PV can also be in those uh, and that's the only place that coal and nuclear can play a part. But even in that application, PV has the advantage of being able to go in faster, and, and PV has a great environmental and safety profile. Fortunately, the grid integration costs of PV have been found to be modest for most locations, and that would come as a surprise to some people, for instance, uh, maybe you've seen a graph of the output of one PV plant and it's really spiky output as the clouds go over. But if you look at the output from a fleet of PV over a region, it's actually very smooth and predictable. But the biggest drivers of growth have been the very fast reduction in costs and prices and the government programs. And I want to close by commenting on those gov government programs because sometimes the full cost of them is seen as a subsidy. But you're getting the power from that plant. So if a feed-in tariff has the same cost as the alternative to generate that same power, it's actually not a subsidy involved. And you have to look at one subtlety in that, in that PV costs are normally put in levelized terms. What that means is you look at the cost levelized over the entire 25 years. There's no escalation with inflation. And sometimes that's compared to current costs or prices, but those costs will be coming up. And in places with high inflation, that raises the LCOE of PV, but it also increases the amount of escalation of the alternative, and that raises that LCOE. Secondly, these government programs can partially level the playing field they can internalize some of the costs uh, for, that aren't accounted for in alternatives, uh, so for instance, some of the, the coal in particular, uh, and it can internalize some of the benefits from photovoltaics, for instance, more jobs. And lastly, all those values were for the current system. The government programs can also accelerate the whole transition. So in addition to the value of that system, you get societal value of getting to the low-cost, sustainable energy system sooner. Thank you. So now with Henning Wicht and Guy Thomasson, we're going to talk about the technology aspect of uh, solar. Guy I will start with you. Can you tell us what role exactly will have a, a technological innovation in the solar? Yeah, I, I must say that after the last discussion, I'm a bit afraid of talking about innovation. <laughs> so... <laughs> try to, to be a bit <laughs> different. So the big question is, can we say that PV is a mature technology? So if you have spent the last five years mining under uh, 
the ground surface. Basically, you have lost a large part of what has happened. And last year, PV was the first source of electricity installed in Europe, ahead of wind, ahead of gas, ahead of all other sources of electricity. It's not just a question of installed capacity, it's also a question of energy produced. So basically, can we say that PV is mature from a market point of view? Yes, to a certain extent. Now the question is, can PV develop now in a sustainable way without any kind of support schemes or financial subsidies? And it's there that innovation enters into the, into the game. And I would say there are two things. I will talk little about the, the increase of efficiency, because this is something we will discuss after. But there is one point that starts to be quite important, especially in Europe, it's system integration. Can we add more PV to electricity system without any major challenges? And this is something in which we will have to work in the coming years. And when I'm saying system integration, it's from an economic point of view, electricity market, but from a grid integration point of view, can I put more PV into existing electricity grids? And we will have a certain number of challenges, and we'll have to clearly find technical solutions to these challenges. And one of the solutions that we will discuss afterwards is clearly the solution of storage. So yeah, Hanning, you just get on, just mention storage. So what, do, what can we expect from technology and storage? Uh, yes. So um, to speak about storage, we have to first have four, th four things in mind. First, the Earth receives in 24 hours more energy from the sun than we consume in one year. Please keep this in mind. Within 24 hours, more energy from the sun than we consume in one year. Second, we were not able to use this energy economically until very, rec very recently. And that you mentioned it, it's a solar panel, it's a solar module which is now able to use this energy. So we convert sunlight into electricity. Now what Gaëtan mentioned is, well, it's a system, but we don't have the infrastructure. So today the PV system only consumes immediately sun into electricity. Our storage today is the grid. This works well so far, but we have to have other storage systems. So as a first comment here, Yes, we have a new energy system coming, but we are in an early stage. Storage will come, we'll see it on different levels. On the grid side, the basic tool today is pumping up water, which we're doing for every other energy as well. But we could store it on also in residential households. This is what we are seeing in coming in Germany, which is the most mature market right now. And so more specifically, what are the new technologies emerging in the, in the solar well, on the, on, the, on, the, on the large volume level, we see that we want to use electricity to convert some uh, yeah, hydrogen, for instance, gas, uh, electricity to gas to re reuse it during the night or, or uh, no uh, sunny times. On, uh, on a smaller scale, indeed, it's uh, lead acid batteries. What you have in your car today, you can, you, you can put in your cellar. It works quite nicely and very cheap. And the more sophisticated tool is in your laptop. It's a lithium iron battery, which works also well. And Gaeta, what, what does the industry, PV industry, expect from storage system? So, I would say that we have three angles to discuss about storage. One little is the economic aspect. I could need storage for just one reason, to make my system competitive. But we have two major technical issues. The first one is, we will need storage and other solutions in order to increase the penetration of PV on distribution grids. But in that case, storage will be in competition with solutions that are for the time being more cost efficient, like smart inverters. And the second one is, if we want to reach very high level of PV penetration, and I'm talking about 10 or 15% of the electricity demand in a country, as you have seen in the previous, in the previous slide, uh, the maximum in Europe for the timing is around 5%. It's in Germany and in Italy. If we want that, we'll have at a certain moment to store PV electricity and or wind electricity at a very large scale. And these are basically the two major challenges that, that are ahead of us. Would you, Doug, would you like to add something? Uh, I think they, they said it well. I'll, I'll just add that 
the forecast for growth for PV right now does not assume low cost storage. Uh, it's one of the energy mix, and that includes demand response and er all the other tools that a utility has to bring to bear on it. But long term, low cost storage would be an enabler for other segments. And so it's very exciting uh, looking at some of the uh, possible pro progress on it. Okay, so thank you. I think this is a great transition to our next uh, speaker. So Donald Sadaway, welcome. You're John F. Elliott, Professor of Materials Chemistry at MIT. You're a world-class expert in electricity storage and batteries. You have done important uh, research on storage technologies. You figured out how to make storage batteries using molten salt and liquid metal and uh, a company has been created. It's very promising. The batteries already work and you and your team are scaling up it now for uh, grid level use. So go ahead for your speech. You have 20 minutes. Could you please, please explain, uh, explain to us the storage technology and the technologies you are working with? Yes, I'll try. And it's very difficult for a professor to speak in only 20 minutes, but I, I have my <laughs> task. So, um, yeah. So this is a, a listing of the various storage technologies. As has been mentioned, lead acid, nickel, cadmium, sodium sulfur, nickel metal hydride, and lithium ion. Um, uh, this is a, a metric that I've put up here. It has nothing to do with uh, stationary storage, but if we start thinking about automobiles, a practical driving range in a car with storage capacity for a family and so on is about one watt hour per kilogram. So you can see that we still have some anxiety range to deal with. Gasoline in the same metrics is at 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. This is why we use gasoline, it's a fantastic fuel. Um, but uh, there are some general ideas that I'd like to share with you before talking about the uh, instant technology. Um, there's no single best battery chemistry. You should use the appropriate chemistry. So don't pay for attributes you don't need. So for example, the cell phone needs to be idiot proof because by and large it's in the hands of idiots. So we have to make sure that it's not going to uh, explode and uh, hurt anybody. The car needs to be crash-worthy, and people who have uh, fallen in love with lithium-ion technology and uh, cell phones think it's a matter of simply installing many cell phone batteries, but there is a, a major safety issue here. Uh, what about the service temperature? Well, that's a function of human contact. And clearly, in the case of stationary batteries for grid-level storage, we don't need human contact. So that gives you more freedom and choice of chemistry, but. The issue here is, even though I'm a professor, I'm talking about cost. The price point has to be super low. And so let's look at some price points. If you have to replace the laptop battery in your computer, you're probably paying $2,000 to $3,000 a kilowatt hour capital cost. Uh, your cell phone is probably $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Uh, the goal right now for automotive traction is 250, and that's a very high number. It really needs to be even lower than that, but 250 is the one that's up there for now. And for stationary storage, $100 per kilowatt hour. So you can see that the cell phone battery is about 10 times the price of the price point of this market because we have an incumbent technology. And the severity of conditions increases from top to bottom and the price increases from bottom to top. So those of you who are free marketeers, there's an example where the social need and the economic imperatives are not aligned at all. In fact, they're counter-aligned. Now, uh, I view storage as an enabler already today that um, the uh, availability of storage would reduce price volatility. There are markets in the United States over a period of 24 hours, the wholesale price can go from $200 per megawatt hour to zero. And tw 20 kilometers away, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, different pricing. Um, increasing reliability so that every distribution feeder or circuit is able to uh, operate autonomously from the transmission and generation assets. That's with storage today, if you had it at that price point. Um, congestion, very important in the United States. The FERC, which is the Federal Electricity Regulation Commission, uh, uh, oversees about half of the United States uh, has calculated two and a half billion dollars uh, per year f for just half, and that is roughly one to three percent of electricity sales. So there's huge amounts of money to be saved with storage implemented today. And then finally, um, this would be very, very useful in massively reducing the investment. Right now, we invest in our electricity uh, hardware to handle the peak load uh, with a reserve margin. 
with storage, we could design to the average load plus margin. And in some markets, there's a 40% differential. If you're talking about over the next two decades, $17 trillion worth of investment, you could lower that by 40%. It's a huge savings. And this says nothing about renewables. This is with the conventional grid. And then if we start thinking about tomorrow, uh, I agree with the speakers here that, that as the amount of renewable becomes non-trivial, tries to get up towards 15%, 20%, then the matter of, of the intermittency becomes something that needs to be mitigated, and obviously storage would be a, a boon in that um, regard. So what's the path forward? Um, well, you know, we're competing against gas-fired peaking units diesel, and you see the difference between hydrocarbon fuel intensity and battery intensity, so we have to think differently. The old paradigm of let's invent the coolest chemistry and then we'll just manufacture many copies and the price will fall doesn't work. The price falls but not low enough. So, by the way, lithium ion, I want to be clear, I have a very strong opinion. It fails badly in this market. It's a 20-year-old technology. It can't even get into electric cars. It certainly can't get into this market. Yeah, a few ancillary services, maybe frequency regulation, but not for bulk storage. It's too expensive. So we have to invent differently, and I say we have to combine our chemistry to earth-abundant elements. And in English, we would say if you want to make something cheap, we say it's dirt cheap. And I say if you want to make it dirt cheap, then you have to make it out of dirt, preferably out of local dirt. And this is a, a chart that I have next with all of my students. I say you have to have two charts the periodic table of the elements, and this chart, which is the table of abundance. And what you can see is there are huge differences. This is a function of the atomic number. The, the lines mean nothing. I don't, I don't know why put, people put lines, because there's nothing between carbon and nitrogen. It's a stupid uh, thing here. But. So if you look up closely, if you want to have something that's scalable for grid-level storage, you have to have huge amounts of the material. And these are the elements you have to work with. You know, oxygen is the most abundant, silicon, and so on. It's no accident that our microelectronic devices are so cheap because nature has been so kind that the very element that gives us the semiconducting properties is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And so we have Moore's Law and we have cheap computers today. Can you imagine if the magic element had been tellurium? We wouldn't have cheap computers today. And cost is everything, as has been mentioned. Pumped hydro is the only uh, technology that really meets the performance requirements at about $100 a kilowatt hour. You see lithium ion, uh, flywheels, flow batteries, all of these things far too expensive. And that's a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. So every time you jump, you go by 10x. So there's nothing there. If sodium sulfur is there artificially. In Japan, they require it. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's down in the weeds. So, now, what did I do differently? I started with a different question. To make a colossal cheap battery, I looked away from batteries. I paid no attention to battery research except to accept it as worst practice. How to find something different. So I looked at economics, and my other area of research is electrometallurgy. So that's aluminum, magnesium, lithium, how you extract these metals. And I looked to an aluminum smelter. And what do you find? You import bauxite, carbon, which is petroleum, coke, 14 kilowatt hours of electricity to make one kilogram of electricity, $5,000 a ton capital cost, and yet we can make virgin metal for $1 per kilo. This is the miracle of modern electrometallurgy. And I said, can I learn something from this that would apply to stationary storage? There's the modern aluminum smelter. It was invented in 1886 by Charles Martin Hall in the U.S., and Paul, he ruled here in France. By the way, they were 22 years of age when they did this. 22. So those of us who are a little bit older than 22, it's, uh, you know, what have you accomplished? And even those youngsters in the audience who are 30, 22. Remember that. All right, so this is what I came up with. So this is a derivative from this uh, aluminum smelter. Only I've replaced the gas anode on top with a second electrode. So we have liquid metal on top, liquid magnesium, molten salt electrolyte, and a heavy metal on the bottom, antimony. They're separated by density. There's no membranes. 
There's no artificial separator there. The magnesium is insoluble in the electrolyte. The electrolyte is insoluble in the antimony. So what's the purpose of the battery? The, the battery is trying to allow magnesium to alloy with the antimony. And in doing so, it dissolves as magnesium ion, dumps two electrons, and on the other side, it consumes two electrons. And so to discharge the battery, you alloy antimony. To charge the battery, you electrorefine the magnesium out. Back and forth, back and forth. So that when you charge it, you're running an electrorefinery. So I had small amount of money from seed funds at MIT. It allowed me to take on one graduate student. This is the liquid metal battery team in 2007. And my student looks very worried. <laughs> He's not sure this is going to work. I wasn't sure it was going to work either. But. And then in 2009, my luck changed. With major funding from Total, uh, Total interested in solar for the home with battery in the basement, and then the new division of the Department of Energy, ARPA-E, for mini grid. So within two months of uh, the end of 2009, I had $13 million, and now this is my group, 20 people. Now with this, we can make major progress. So this is students, postdocs, and um, from, it's probably about seven or eight countries representative, and uh, so on. So we've, we've gone through a series of inventions. We continue to invent. I showed you magnesium antimony. I call that Gen Zero. We looked at sodium bismuth uh, onto lithium antimony, calcium antimony, and we continue to invent because the database is not complete, and we're making major discoveries just in terms of the basic science. And the dr drive here is to go to lower and lower cost. And you can see that there's no gold, there's no platinum, there's no fancy chemicals there. It's all earth abundant. So this is a three-quarter inch, one watt hour cell. Then a hockey puck. I'm originally from Canada, so I use a hockey puck as a size. And then uh, we call the saucer, I think, is next. And you can see the scales. One watt hour, 20 watt hours, 200 watt hours. And by the way, these are mild steel containers. There's no tungsten, there's no boron nitride, no fancy ceramics, mild steel. And this is a cutaway of one of the cells. This is the magnesium on the top. This is the molten salt. Of course, it's solid at room temperature. And this is the negative, that's the, the electronegative, the, um, the antimony. So this is some data. I, I, don't, I don't want to scare people, but I just want to point out that there really is some scientific measurement here. And you can see the voltage is a function of capacity. And it's a low voltage system. It's about uh, half a volt open circuit. We draw current that voltage falls. Coulombic efficiency is good, but the electrodes are way too expensive. And it operates at high temperature, 700, and it's low voltage. So it's terrible, except for one thing. It proved the concept. We were able to store energy and get it back. Oh, by the way, it, it fails after a few cycles. Now you know why he looks worried. But we continued to invent. We, we looked at sodium bismuth, which there was some reference to it in the literature at one point in the national labs, lower temperature, but we'd read that it ran for a long time, and we were able to uh, pr uh, make the same uh, success in our laboratory and convince ourselves that the liquid metal battery could work if we got all of the chemistry right. But again, very expensive electrodes. It was at a national lab. Of course, they weren't paying attention to cost. Uh, low coulombic efficiency, um, but very long service lifetime. So then we continued to invent, and based on our, uh, our knowledge of chemistry and uh, some new measurements, we put together lithium with antimony and then ultimately lithium lead antimony, made all of our own measurements. And now we have something that's closer to a one volt system, and then we made a major discovery. You see the top purple line is uh, solid antimony as the positive electrode. Lead is an impurity. The blue line is lead, it's low voltage. But the black line is the mixture of lead and antimony, so you dilute with a cheap, low-voltage material, and you get still the performance of the high-voltage material at a lower temperature. So this is very good. Low cost, high voltage, and low temperature. And so this is some cycling data. Now it's 450 degrees at around 1 volt, much more acceptable. Electrode cost, $84 a kilowatt hour. You see the price keeps coming down, down, down high coulombic efficiency, and 
This is cycle test data. So what you're looking at is the amount of energy that's stored as a function of cycle number. This is out beyond about 300 cycles. The fade rate is about 0.005% per cycle. And what that means is that after 15 years of daily cycling, you'd still have greater than 72% retention of the initial charge. So this is a long-lived battery, and it's cheap. I don't want to show you how, how hard we can push these cells. Lithium-ion cells typically run some tens of milliamps per square centimeter. This is in hundreds of milliamps per square centimeter, and I want to, you to see that over this range, it was 1,000 milliamps per square centimeter. This is higher than the intensity in an aluminum smelter, only we're running a battery. And after having done so, the performance here at the later cycles is better than it was here in the lower cycles. The battery got better for being abused. That maybe says something psychological deep here. <laughs> I know I'm in France. There may be something existential here. But you can see the battery went beyond 1,000 cycles with intensive abuse. So I'm going to wrap it up by simply uh, reporting that we've tested over 800 different cells with many different chemistries, and uh, some of them quite cheap, and the capacity fade acceptable for long-term operation. And then we wanted to accelerate to a self-heating cell, so we formed a startup company. The original name was Liquid Metal Battery Corporation, but then we changed the name to Ambry recently. Um, it's shorter to say. So I want to just say a little bit about innovation, maybe to give an antidote to some of the pessimism from the earlier uh, um, session. So we established this in 2010. We got our Series A funding from Bill Gates. Bill Gates came to see me because he had been uh, watching my chemistry lectures online. He wanted to meet me, and during that conversation, we talked about liquid metal battery research, and he said, if you ever decide to start a company, call me. I'd be happy to make an investment. So about a year later, I did. I called him, and he made an investment. And then Total was the other partner in that Series A. And then just in May of this year, there was Series B, again, from Total and Bill Gates, and uh, Coastal Ventures, which is a venture capital firm from the West Coast. And now we have about 22 people at a 900-square-meter facility in Cambridge. And by the way, this is where the name Embry comes from. It came out of the heart of Cambridge. That's where the idea came. That's where I invented it. So now you see the uh, progress. Now we have 40-centimeter diameter single cell, one kilowatt hour, cycling. And the idea is to aggregate these into stacks, stacks into modules, modules into something the size of a 40-foot shipping container, and this is two megawatt hours, half a megawatt. Or this could go in the basement of a skyscraper. So I put for you, this is grid-level storage. It's silent, it's not like a diesel generator. Emissions free, no moving parts, and it's remotely controlled, so it can take a signal remotely from the grid and start playing in a frequency regulation, spinning reserves market while storing charge. But it was designed to the price point of the market without subsidy. So what are the next steps? We continue working at MIT, discovering new alloys and salts, continue the scale up at Ambry to the self-heating stack, and now establishing strategic relationships. Who's going to build these batteries? We're not going to build them in Massachusetts and ship them all over the world. They're too heavy. So they're going to be built in France somewhere. They're going to be built in the United States in several places. They're going to be built in China, so on. So who's the partner? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Donald Sadewey. Gaetan, uh, we continue with, the, we will tell, uh, now talk about the market for solar. What can you tell us about the volume and the prices that can be reached by using the technologies? Yeah, just uh, 30 seconds comments. It's quite impressive. I think we can call it innovation. It's, it's one of... <laughs> um, on the solar market, especially photovoltaic markets, it's a market that has been driven by public sub subsidies. We call it support schemes, but it's anyway, the, it's anyway the case. And this year, as it was already told, we will reach more than probably 30 gigawatt of installed capacity in the entire world. Something like 15 to 18 gigawatt will be installed in Europe 
So which means that basically the European market is stagnating or even going down and that the market outside Europe is growing for the first time. If we look at long-term targets for PV, basically we believe that PV could represent in between 4 and 8% of the electricity demand in Europe in 2020, so in eight years from now. And that in 2030, it could be in between 10 and 15%. So people are even more ambitious, but this would require a perfect, let's say, regulatory framework in all European countries and a more stable uh, economic situation than what we have for the time being. So basically the big question is how to reach such, level, such levels of penetration. 4 to 8% in 2020 or even 15% in 2030, it's just a continuation of the current market. So it's not something that is out of reach. It's globally installing in between 15 and 20 gigawatts in Europe every year. And so if we go to the next slide, what is the main driver? The main driver remains, of course, the cost, but not only the cost. What we can see here is a projection of standard prices for PV system in Europe in the, in the 10 coming years. What we can see is that depending on the size of the system, we can have higher or lower prices. But besides the cost of the system in itself, the cost of electricity produced depends on a certain number of factors. And the first one is, of course, the irradiation how much sun I receive and I can, I can transform into electricity. But the second one is clearly the cost of capital that can change totally the cost of the electricity produced at the end. And just to give an idea, today we can produce, in Germany for instance, electricity below 20, cents, 20 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And the price of electricity in Germany, the retail price of electricity is around 25 cents. If we go in Spain and if we consider large scale PV system finance at a reasonable cost, we can even go down to eight, sometimes seven cents per kilowatt hour. And because of that, those prices for that we can reach will inevitably lead to new markets being opened, especially outside Europe, without subsidies in the coming years. And it will clearly make PV competitive. It's already the case in a certain number of market segments in a certain number of countries. But it will clearly make PV competitive bef before the end of this decade in dozens and dozens of countries in the world. It will make PV competitive with gas, with diesel generators, with most of conventional energy sources. So thank you. Now we will focus on uh, solar market uh, in the US with you, Doug. Doug, you're Vice President of Strategy and Technology uh, for SunPower. SunPower, I think you know, is a global uh, major player with a strong presence in the US. Uh, uh, could you first please present us SunPower and then give us uh, the perspectives of the Sun solar market in the US? Oh, Doug. With, with pleasure. Uh, but first, because SunPower is a public company, I need to inform you that any forward-looking statements I make are subject to risk. See our SEC filings for details of some of those risks and uncertainties. <sighs> Glad to get that out of the way. Uh, now for the fun part. Uh, SunPower makes the highest energy collection systems uh, in the industry today. We're vertically integrated from ingot through the end customer, uh, either ourselves or with partners. Uh, for instance, on large systems, uh, we, we do those ourselves or with partners, and we also have uh, a very extensive network of authorized dealers. Our sales are over $2 billion a year, and that's driven by our customers in residential, commercial, government, and utilities that recognize our quality and our experiments, experience. Well, this morning, you know, we heard the importance of moving to low carbon sustainable energy systems as soon as possible. That it's cheaper to do it earlier rather than later. And on top of that, there's about one and a half billion people in the world that don't have access to electricity. And just a little bit of it makes a big difference in their lives. So what we're doing is good and it's important. And Total is a key part of it. Last year, Total made a transformational investment in SunPower. Uh, and the support they're providing uh, includes things like collaboration on mid and long-term research and development, credit support, uh, and even 
working to use their global reach uh, to expand our markets. Now, moving to technology, the core of our technology is our all-back contact cells. Uh, the next slide shows what that cell looks like in the module it results from it compared to a traditional uh, module. And having all the contacts on the back makes for higher efficiency. We're able to have an average of 20.4% modules versus typical in the industry of 14 or 15%. But it also really helps reliability. The, the cells are built on a, a thick copper, uh, and that uh, helps deal with some of the most common failure modes. If you look with traditional modules in the field, 85% uh, of the field failures come from corrosion or thermal cycling. And that graph shows that in 8,000 hours of damp heat, the sun power modules have degraded uh, very little. And that's eight times the certification standards. And in, in thermal cycling, we have almost no degradation at 10 times the certification standards. Well, the result of that is very low field failures. If you look at the technology that we've fielded since 2006, we've had a return rate of 27 modules per 1 million modules shipped. And that shows how it all comes together with the, the highest value technology. More power per roof helps the customer. It has advantages for the installer, so it's less per watt to install. And since they get more on the roof, it's even their fixed costs are less per watt. The technology inherently has more energy per watt, has the better reliability, and it looks better too which for residences can be really important. People really like those all black modules. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for letting me talk about SunPower. I always love to do it. Uh, now let me fill you in on the U.S. market. Uh, the U.S. market has been growing very fast. Uh, current forecasts are for 75% growth this year versus last. Uh, with that growth continuing to be over eight, mega, uh, eight gigawatts in 2016, and so what's driving all that growth? Well, partly it's prices have been falling in the U.S., but they're still way above where they are in Germany. But fortunately, a lot of the U.S. gets about twice the sun that is in Germany, which, which makes up for it. Uh, also, in the U.S., the peak often occurs in, in summer afternoons, right when the PV is producing. So the electricity can have value far above baseload value. Uh, there, for instance, there was a study done in Texas by the Brattle Group that showed if that grid had had five gigawatts of PV, and it's a pretty small grid, it would have had a value of over 21 cents a kilowatt hour. And so if we compare that to costs in the U.S., uh, the next slide shows the predictions by Lazard Group of cost down to 60, uh, 6 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, $60 per megawatt hour. And that's only including the federal incentives, which primarily are the 30% investment tax credit. So while there's a lot of work to do in the U.S. market to, to maximize the, the growth potential, it's looking pretty good. So, Doug, can you tell us a bit more about the specific technologies that are deployed in the U.S.? Is there a dominant technology? And uh, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the market share? Certainly. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give it on a, a world market. Uh, U.S. is, is similar to, to the world. At the world level, <coughs> it's 90% share for crystalline silicon right now, and that includes both monocrystalline and, and multicrystalline. And that's up from 80% three years ago. And thin films, so cadmium telluride, copper indium gallium diselenide, organics, uh, comprise the the, the balance uh, of that uh, and amorphous silicon. Uh, there was real excitement about 25 years ago in, in thin films, but they've struggled to keep up with the progress of crystalline silicon. However, First Solar, which uses cadmium telluride, has been very successful in power plant development. Uh, and many people think that thin films and concentrated PV still has an important role to play in many segments.
Okay, thank you. So, Henning, now let's focus on Germany, a country with little sun, as Doug said, just said. So, what, what can you say about grid parity? Is solar competitive? Yeah, indeed, uh, Germany has as much sun as Alaska. So, <laughs> keep this in mind. Yeah. So, we are very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, we have grid parity. Grid parity means if you have a solar system on your roof, you can produce your energy at the same price or lower price than what you get from EDF from any utility in your region. This means grid parity. Your solar system is cheaper. We have this in Germany since last year, end of last year. What is more important is that companies are investing in solar systems to produce their own power. There's a supermarket chain in southern parts of Germany. They equipped 100 supermarkets with PV panels, and the idea is to generate and consume locally. They don't want to feed to the grid. They don't want the money from the government. They want only to consume the power by themselves, and this is really grid parity. I think there's a second example we should look at. So, um, Gaetan mentioned 5% market penetration of PV in Germany. This means over the year, 5% of all electricity consumed is coming from PV. But at sunny days in May or in September, about 30, 40, 50 percent of the electricity is coming from wind and, so and, and solar. That's a very, a very strange situation, which the grid management is not, is not uh, able to use to work with. So I think this is another point we have to keep in mind. And since last year, or until early this year, I would say May was a key point. The big utilities were fighting against solar. Stop these solar fundings. They kill our markets. They kill our, our margins. Since May, since June, I would say, when RWE, one of the big utilities, changed the head of its management, they put solar on top. And this is important to notice. The last point here, maybe, we need the infrastructure. So I. Thanks for your presentation. I like that very much. We are very curious when do we see a prototype on the market. Um, so indeed, we have grid parity, um, but we need the infrastructure. And then we will go far further, and I expect to see market even growing faster than what Gaetan said. So, but Henning, uh, what would be the true price if there were no subsidies? Yeah, uh, the price would be the same. That's the funny part. If we have no subsidies, the price of the PV system will be the same. You can go and ask an installer, um, please put on my roof a five kilowatt system, and he will say, okay, this is about 10,000 euros. What is different is there will be no fundings on the kilowatt hours you produce. So then it's again the question what to do. And the first thing is you say, okay, I consume by my own. Second is can I store or can I sell? So here's a, here are a lot of opportunities because the infrastructure is not there. There's no storage. If you have a storage system now, you can sell it, you can make a big money. If you have a business model to sell the electricity, big opportunity. So this will come, and I expect not only the utilities to work on that, but new companies to enter, which are used to work with decentralized structures. And you name it, can be Google, can be IBM, can somebody big. So, Doug, how did we reach so quickly <coughs> grid parity? I think everybody knows that PV, PV prices have declined quickly uh, because of China's cost position. Can you tell us a bit more about the price curve? Uh, certainly. Uh, a big driver of the cost reductions have been in the module. And the price of modules over the last 33 years have fallen more than 97.5%. And that decrease has been very consistent. About 20 years ago, uh, it was noticed that the price was dropping by about 20% for every doubling of cumulative capacity. And that reduction is continued uh, to today. If you look at the deviation that was there in, from that graph, uh, that was in mid to late 2010, uh, mid like 2004 to 2010. And that came from a shortage of the starting material for crystalline silicon. As the companies that 
We're producing that and new entrants built additional capacity to fulfill that shortage. Uh, the prices of, of that have fallen. And so we're getting the benefits of that. But right now we're also um, seeing the impacts of uh, really big hits to margin in the industry throughout the value chain. And that's why we're below the price that would be predicted by the historical learning curve. Uh, basically, prices now uh, are consistent with the cost reductions that are yet to come. And Gaetan, what, what do you think we can expect from, from uh, innovation in terms of reducing the kilowatt price? Well, first of all, we clearly have to go out of the current market imbalance. The total production capacity today is twice the size of the market. And there are too many constraints all over the world to let the market grow fast enough to reach the level of production capacity that we have. But this is just one thing. If we look at uh, how the price went down, we can say that basically half of the price decrease could be associated to economies of scale. And that's where the Chinese came, not only the Chinese. But on the other side, there is a large part that is coming from the technology itself, and especially the improvement in efficiency. And there, there are a certain number of companies, and clearly SunPower is clearly the leading company in that sector uh, that have contributed a lot. So it was just a little comment on the fact that China is not the only responsible. I would say now that something that will be quite important to lower the cost of the kilowatt hour, and this is the cost of capital, and I will go pretty fast on that, but this is something quite important. Now that PV will not be, in the coming years, supported by financial support schemes, investors will look at the real cash flow and the real production and the uncertainty about the price at which electricity can be sold. And it will clearly lead to, if not an increase in the, the cost of capital, at least at cost of capital that could uh, prevent the, the, production, the cost of electricity to go down fast enough. And I believe that we will see more, um, more need for certification and standardization, both at production level, but also at uh, installation level. And so what can you say about the, the next, the third and the fourth generation of solar cells? That's a good question. Um, I think a PV is not a revolution, revolutionary industry. It's more an evolutionary industry, which means that what we have for the timing is already quite good and improves gradually year after year. So there are a certain number of interesting things in the labs. The big question is, are we going to see these interesting things in the lab going in the markets and uh, prevail on what exists for the time being? I do not believe so. I think that the market will continue to be driven by existing technologies. And what kind of technologies do you see in the labs? So we can talk about interesting things like uh, the deposition of, on thin film of, uh, of steel plates, for instance. But I believe that in general, improvement will come from uh, new products or existing products being adapted to the building sector, when you will be able to replace some parts of the envelope of the building with the same components, but photovoltaic. I think it will be a major element, but this is, not the, this is clearly not the only one. And as I was saying previously, I believe that a large part of technological improvement will come from grid integration features. Uh, because this is clearly what will be needed to improve and to increase the penetration of PV in uh, electricity grids. This is clearly what's going to happen in Europe. In other parts of the world, including the US, the penetration is still quite low, and this will come later. But in Europe, this will be something quite important. And Henning, would you like to make a comment on what you have heard? What, what do you think? What can we expect from innovation? Yeah. Yeah, first, I, I think we, we really have to understand that in the current mode of the industry, the innovations are, are um, failing, very simply. We have a mainstream which is dominating the companies. We have a heavy overcapacity. Uh, margins are at zero level, and uh, the mainstream is driving the cost down. And no, or none of the emerging uh, technologies or second, third, fourth generation are able to follow this fast decline of cost, and they are going out of business. This is what we see in the current mode. Um, to comment on the innovation side, I think. Um, We'll see a lot of innovations and also successful innovations. Um, for in the short term, indeed, uh, more about grid integration. 
Uh, second, of course, it's always related the efficiency of a cell. So for, to give you a picture, I mean, you know the, these panels, which is about one meter, four, one meter 40, about 160, or 20, 160. And uh, inside you have 60 cells, or the size of a, of a half side uh, page here. And these cells, these are the key elements. They produce, they collect the, the, the photons and convert into, into electrons. Now, these cells, they are on, there's the R&D is going on to increase the efficiencies to get more electrons out of the same piece. If we look at the whole device, which is again the 120 by 160, this is a 20 kilogram heavy tool. However, the active material is only 800 grams. So there's a lot of innovation coming into the material frame, in the product frame, to reduce this 20 kilogram of surrounding materials. And so, uh, talking about uh, sun power, how do you position sun power in the market today? Yes. Penning? Well, as an analyst, um, we are always very, uh, looking uh, and, uh, at the companies, at the leading companies, we are looking at supply demand. And what, what Doug mentioned before about the price decline, we were able to discover that quite, at, I think even at the as the first analyst in 2009, saying that module prices will come down very fast. Now, with regard to, to sun power, I think the challenge we see for uh, sun power having a kind of exotic, a little exotic technology is to keep ahead of the mainstream. This is uh, the challenge where I see, but I also know that Doug has some, some bullets in the pocket. Okay, so Doug, so my last question is for you. Uh, we continue talking about technology. So can you tell us what kind of technology you are commercializing? Uh, with pleasure. I, I really love talking about our technology, and I'll share some of those bullets that, that we have. Um, the first technology I want to talk about is a next-generation module that we're commercializing. We're in uh, low-volume low production now uh, of this module, and we've got already an average total area module efficiency of 21.4%. And it has even better energy per rated watt compared to our old module. Uh, that old module is still very much in production, huge capacity, and has a lot higher energy per rated watt than traditional technology. Uh, next thing I'll talk about is our systems. We've got about a gigawatt of systems installed in the field, and the next picture so shows what central station power plants can look like. Uh, that's the beginning of construction of a 250 megawatt AC power plant. But there are technologies associated with those power plants as well. One of them is called AVR, Automatic Voltage Regulation. And we can actually help stabilize the transmission grid voltage. That voltage is much more stable with the PV system with this feature than it is with no PV system. But the technology I want to talk about the most and I'm most excited about is a new one we're commercializing in, in low concentration space. Uh, we've been working on the system for years, and it leverages work that we've done on cells and systems for decades. Uh, our cell was originally developed to be in concentrator systems. So we can use our standard cells just with a, a little different metal pattern. Uh, and those cells come out as having a higher efficiency than they are in used at one sun. Uh, another advantage is because it's a tracker-based system, uh, we have uh, a lot of extra energy uh, compared to fixed tilt. And that energy um, comes most notably in the summer late afternoon when the utilities can want it most. Now, we've been working on the system with bankability as our top priority. It's the key to the uh, reasonable financing, uh, have the customers understand that it is safe to go with this system. And we've done things like go in with click-in, glass mirrors that have been field proven for over 25 years, uh, click-in receivers that can be upgraded later if warranted, uh, and uh, some proprietary airflow and heat management technologies that actually keep the cells at the same or lower temperatures 
than the cells in a flat plate module would be in, in, in the same location. Have great energy production uh, prediction capability. It's really working out to be spot on. Uh, and lastly, and very importantly, uh, it enables the capital efficient growth. So picture one gigawatt of manufacturing capacity and the factories you have to have for that. With this LCPV system, you can get the equivalent of over six gigawatts of PV. Beyond that, we, we are working on next, next generation technologies. I, I can't talk too much about it, but I will say that there's a lot of runway left in the high efficiency wafer-based uh, cells for cost reduction and performance. Uh, there's also a lot of potential for thin crystalline silicon, and there are ways to improve the efficiency of the LCPV systems. I will add one last thought. It, it is a painful transition time in the industry right now. Margins are low or sometimes negative uh, across much of the industry as we go through the, the needed capacity reduction. But the technology advances that I've talked about and are going on in the industry uh, are gonna keep moving us forward and get us to that goal of changing the way the world is powered.